Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, and welcome to Managing Conflict in Open Source Communities. Everyone can hear me okay? Excellent. Great. Uh, so uh, my, my day job that I get paid for is uh, that I am the founder and CEO of Palantir, .NET, the .NET is important. Uh, we're a full service web agency based in Chicago and we work uh, with a variety of different open source technologies. Um, but the reason I'm here today uh, talking with all of you all is really more in the context of my community involvement. Uh, so we've been working with open source, I've been working with open source for 20 years now and, um, and I don't know how to code. Um, you really don't want me to write your module or uh, anything like that. The last time I was really useful in terms of web development was around the time uh, when we still needed Internet Explorer 6 support. So that's not how I contribute to open source. Um, I volunteer my time in a variety of different ways focused around uh, the people side of open source, so around community, around governance, uh, things like that. And for the last few years, um, I have uh, chaired the Drupal Community Working Group. So we're a volunteer group chartered by our project lead that's responsible for upholding the Drupal Community Code of Conduct and helping mediate conflicts that arise. So Drupal, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is one of the world's largest open source projects. We have over 100,000 active contributors. It's an absolutely enormous community. Uh, Drupal is used by millions of sites all around the world uh, and, and the project has been around for about 15 years, over 15 years now. And uh, over that time we've gone from being this kind of small hobbyist community to this really large project that's used by, you know, enterprises at every level as well as by people for their personal blogs. So it's a really amazing community to be a part of. And well, along with that growth, right, we've had some growing pains, right? So Drupal has grown progressively more complex with every major release. The time between releases has increased. And more is being asked of the developer community by customers and end users, right? So as a result, we've seen this kind of increased stress, this in increased pressure, which results in frustration and conflict, right? Um, it's something that occurs in every open source project, but it's really when you kind of get to that growing pains place, right? Where you're no longer kind of a bunch of people who are all know each other and coming together to build a project, where you're uh, this enormous project with people all over around the world that you start to really see, um, you know, some of these issues. So this is from a 2016 survey uh, that we took of Drupal contributors asking them about their experiences during the Drupal 8 development cycle. Drupal 8 came out at the end of 2015. Uh, so over 60% of respondents had experienced or observed conflict. And this is actually fairly consistent with the results that we see from other open source projects. So last year, the folks at GitHub conducted a survey across hundreds of different open source projects. Uh, which found that 18% of respondents have personally experienced a negative interaction with another user in open source, but half have witnessed one between other people. So this is a problem that we're all dealing with. Now, I want to be really clear that the ability to exchange ideas with others is a big part of what makes open source great, right? Uh, and not all conflict is bad, right? positive, respectful disagreements where people are actually listening to each other and seeking to find common ground can contribute to a cross-pollination of ideas, challenge existing preconceptions, and help people find creative and innovative solutions to problems and generate innovation, right? That's what makes open source so awesome and sets it apart from so many other models for developing software. The problem is when People don't feel like they're being heard. They don't feel like they're being listened to or that their contributions are being valued, right? Or that their interests aren't being represented. Or that they feel hurt by something that someone else said or did, right? And, and fundamentally, conflict is about unmet needs, right? This negative conflict. So what we want to try and do is address these issues, these problems, so that people feel even if they don't agree with a decision that was made, 
that they've been heard, and that they are part of a community. So some of the kinds of issues, right, that manifest uh, all the time in open source, right? Um, many of these will probably seem very familiar to many of you, right? Technical disagreements that turn into personal attacks, you know. Well, you only want to do that because it benefits your, your company or agency, or you, you've always been against this solution because it's my idea, whatever, right? Uh, frustration with the amount of time that it takes to review patches. Uh, in, in Drupal, we have uh, project applications had to go through a gateway for a while, and that was a, caused a tremendous amount of frustration. Folks felt that there were artificial blockers to contributing, or if they contributed something, it would take a really long time for someone else to look at it and review it and you know, provide feedback. And that is uh, an intense form of frustration. Uh, People just, for any of the uh, you know, above reasons or for others, just lashing out uh, you know, in the issue queues, uh, venting their frustration, uh, you know, rage quitting. Um, you know, I literally, before this, uh, you know, right before this uh, session started, we got a, a report just like one of these where uh, someone was really upset that they weren't getting uh, the technical support that they were looking for, and they're like, well, this is why this project sucks, right? And then uh, finally, we'll talk a little bit more about this later in a little more detail. Uh, harassment and trolling on social media and in Slack, right? Uh, or IRC, if, you're, if your project still uses IRC, um, or uses, sorry, sorry. <laughs> still uses uh, IRC um, or uses one of the other open source uh, alternatives to Slack, right? Uh, regardless of, of the tool you use, there, there is harassment and trolling and personal attacks and other issues that manifest. So the consequences of this, right? Uh, Obviously, we have a decline in contributor morale. People don't really feel like contributing if uh, everyone's fighting all the time, which uh, also results in a decline in productivity in the project. Um, lead to people leaving the project. When we go back to that GitHub survey, uh, I said that 21% of people who experienced or witnessed a negative behavior said that they stopped contributing to a project because of it. And when you keep in mind that that's over half the people who are, who are experiencing or witnessing conflict and 21% of them end up leaving, that's a big problem. That's a huge drain on, on any open source project. And then people might you know, choose not to join a project, right? If a project has a reputation for being a place you know, with a toxic atmosphere where people are fighting all the time, uh, then they're gonna be less interested in being a part of that. And then ultimately, this has an impact on diversity, right? And so some of these, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. If you were at the uh, diversity panel earlier today, they, they went into some of these numbers. Um, you know, but essentially, according to GitHub, only 3% of open source code uh, contributions are made by women. Um, in Drupal, we measure about 6% of the recorded contributions are by women. Um, and even at our in-person events, uh, like DrupalCon, we're lucky if we can get 20% women in attendance, right? So there are, I think this is really hard to measure uh, unless you're just measuring code. But I think one of the key points I want to make is that there's lots of different ways to contribute to open source that are not just about code. Um, there is literally, I did a ton of research on this. I've talked with a few folks. There is no good uh, data on representation in open source by people of color. Uh, there, I think, may have been some studies that were done about 15 years ago, uh, but we really don't know uh, because, you know, we can kind of guess when we look around rooms and we, you know, talk with people and we see who shows up at conferences that people of color are, are very often uh, underrepresented. 16% uh, of the people in GitHub's uh, open source survey identified themselves as racial or ethnic minorities in the country that they live in. 
if we apply that to the United States, where I'm from, uh, that uh, about 35 to 40 percent of the population identifies as a minority. So that tells me that uh, you know we have a disproportionate underrepresentation there. But this is one of those places where more research is definitely required. What we do know is that women are far more likely than men to encounter language or content that makes them feel unwelcome, uh, as well as stereotyping and unsolicited uh, sexual advances, right? And unsurprisingly, as a result, that means that women are also uh, more likely than men to seek out uh, help directly from people they already know, rather than ask for help from strangers in a public forum or channel. Right? And if you think about it, right, collaboration between strangers is, again, one of open source's most remarkable aspects. Right? So what we need to do is strive to build a community where everyone feels welcome to participate. And, you know, and again, the impact of this is highlighted by the fact that on GitHub, pull requests by women are actually more likely to be merged than those uh, made by men. But that's only true if their gender can't be identified from their profile. This was a study that someone did. And open source work is an incredibly important way for people to build their professional reputation, right? Half of uh, contributors say that their open source work was somewhat or very important in getting their current role. Open, and so improving contributor representation can help create a more representative uh, tech sector overall, even beyond just open source. So, this is the big point, right? Reducing negative conflict helps make open source more welcoming, more inclusive, and more innovative. So how do we go about doing that, right? So a lot of open source projects have codes of conduct, right? In its very simplest form, a code of conduct is a policy that's used by an organization to establish standards for behavior and appropriate conduct when interacting with others in a defined space, right? Whether that be a conference, a workplace, project, event venue, this conference has a code of conduct. Most of the projects that you work on have a code of conduct. Most of the events you go to associated with other proje with projects have a code of conduct. So, in the context of, of a virtual community, right, as opposed to a physical space, codes of conduct are designed to help create inclusive places where people can feel safe and welcome to contribute. And again, the research shows us that documentation that clearly explains a project's processes, such as contrib contribution guides and codes of conduct, are valued more by groups that are underrepresented in open source. So, a well-written and well-implemented code of conduct can help address some of these issues, right? By making it clear that the community does value openness, does value diversity, and are committed to providing an inclusive space that's free of uh, harassment, where people are welcome to contribute in a professional manner. So, Now, to be really clear, just having a code of conduct does not get rid of every issue, right? But what it does is it sets the ground rules, right? And it makes sure that everyone understands the values of, of your community and the ground rules for interacting with others, right? So uh, the contributor covenant and the citizen code of conduct are fantastic starting points. Uh, there are lots of other uh, good codes of conduct, c code of conduct models out there. Uh, there's Django Project uh, Code of Conduct, which has also been adopted by the jQuery Foundation and others. Of course, right, here's the big caveat, right? Code of Conduct is worthless if there's no structures to support it or mechanisms to enforce it. So different projects, again, handle this in different ways, right? So sometimes it's the responsibility of uh, one of the project's maintainers uh, or an existing group, such as a technical working group. So examples of this would be uh, Ruby on Rails or Kubernetes, right, where it's very tightly tied to the folks who are in charge of the project overall. Uh, in projects with uh, strong corporate sponsorship or oversight, uh, it might be handled by an employee of the company 
or a professional community manager who's hired specifically for that purpose. Uh, so some examples there would be Mozilla, uh, Microsoft, and Google for the open source projects that they run. Or uh, it could be a dedicated group made up of volunteers from the community, right? So that would be uh, some examples there, jQuery, Django, and of course, Drupal. Regardless of what the model is, Ideally, you want to have multiple people who are empowered to handle code of conduct reports. You need to have these people fully understand and appreciate the responsibility that's involved, as well as be folks who other members of the community can feel safe talking to and can trust to handle any reports that they make with discretion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do in Drupal, because um, that's what I'm very, very familiar with. Uh, so we have the Drupal Community Working Group. Uh, there are uh, between four and six of us on the group at any one time. We are an all-volunteer body. Uh, we have no staff. We have no resources. We have no legal representation. Uh, we do not have a formal relationship with the Drupal Association, which is the nonprofit that is responsible for the Drupal.org website, uh, the events, and some of the other things associated with the project. We're an independent group that is chartered directly by Dries Boitart, the project lead. Uh, so he uh, appoints or approves its members, and if somebody appeals a decision that we make, uh, he would be the designated person to review that. Um, so we have a couple of primary chartered responsibilities. Uh, we're chartered to uphold the community code of conduct, uh, help resolve conflicts between community members, and maintain documentation and processes related to community health. There's some, some tension, actually, between these primary chartered responsibilities, because upholding the code of conduct kind of puts us in an enforcer role, whereas helping resolve conflicts between community members puts us in more of a mediator role. And so this is something that's been a little bit of a, of a challenge in terms of how we work with community members, understanding the context in which we are talking with them about an issue, right? Because sometimes it will be a, hey, you did this thing and it was really not cool and we need to talk about it. And sometimes it's like, hey, I see you two are having a disagreement and it's getting a little heated, let's talk it out, right? And folks especially in the heat of the moment, don't always understand uh, which context uh, we're approaching that conversation. So it's really important for us to be clear about that. Um, we do other things, too, because, you know, honestly, those of us who are on the committee, we care about our, uh, our, our community greatly, and we want to help it be the best that it can. So, you know, one of the things we do is we recognize and support community leadership. We give out an annual award to folks. You get a free, uh, really cool little trophy, and you get a, a, a free pass to the uh, DrupalCon conference. Uh, and it's, it's nominated by members of the community for somebody who shows kindness and a, a, a above and beyond dedication and devotion to the community. And we've been able to recognize some truly wonderful people, and it's, it's, it's really great to see that kind of recognition for folks who are doing something, helping make the community and the project better in a way that goes beyond just contributing code. Um, we provide resources, consultation, and advice. Sometimes someone will come and be like, hey, I'm wrestling with this problem. I don't necessarily have a report or an issue that I want to file. I just am looking for some advice. And so uh, we'll provide that to the extent that we can. And then, of course, right, sharing, which is kind of what I'm doing today, right, sharing the experience and best practices that we've learned with folks from other uh, open source projects. Um, and this is something I really want to see more of uh, in general. So I'm really happy that we have this venue here today <laughs> to be able to do that. Um, so. This is a lot of stuff to do. This work is really complex. It's really time consuming, and very often it's emotionally draining. Uh, and it is, it is a lot for, uh, for a volunteer group to do, but somehow we muddle through. Um, 
So I love this quote uh, by Bell Hooks, uh, who's an American author and scholar. Uh, she says, for me, forgiveness and compassion are always linked. How do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing and yet at the same time remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed, right? And this is kind of the frame that we try to approach conflict and issues in our community, right? We don't think of ourselves as the Drupal police, right? Uh, we don't, our role is not to decide who's right and who's wrong in a given situation, as much as it is about helping people in our community work together in a mutually respectful way and to take responsibility for the impact of their words and actions, right? And um, I mean, yeah. And, and so usually it's, it's not about what you said was wrong so much as, hey, what you said had this impact on someone else and it's important to understand that and, and to own that and to the extent possible, take responsibility for making it right. So we want people to have as much control over the outcome of their dispute if they're in conflict as possible while still maintaining a safe and welcoming community. And this is hard because, you know, very often <laughs> the very natural reaction is, hey, someone said or did something that really hurt me and I want them to pay. I want them to be punished. And that's not really what we're set up to do. If somebody does something that's really wrong and they need to be removed, we have no qualms about doing that. But if it's a, a dispute that can be settled between two people, we're going to do our darndest to find the way to do that. So, a big part of this is about process, right? So unless an issue requires immediate action, uh, our process is designed to enable resolutions that are as thoughtful and as permanent as possible, as opposed to reacting quickly based on emotion. Um, and this means that it can be, take a long time, it can be drawn out, right? And I think uh, one way to think about it is when you have people who are uh, maybe at a, at a bar who are about to get into a fight because they're really upset at each other for one reason or another, and sometimes what you need to do is just kind of get these people outside and separate them from each other and talk them down a little bit. Uh, when we can do that, that's what we're going to try and do. So, uh, so when an issue comes into us, right, uh, what we'll do is we'll gather as much information as possible uh, from all the involved parties. Um, we, in order to ensure that people are able to share their stories with us in an open and honest manner, we don't share any names or other sensitive details outside the group without permission, right? So once we have that kind of sufficient level of detail to get started, we meet as a group. Uh, we uh, have weekly meetings on Hangouts. Um, our group is distributed. Uh, we have folks in the United States. We have folks in, who are based in South America. We have folks who are based in the UK and Europe. Um, and so we get together once a week. We also have a, a private Slack channel that we, that we uh, maintain and can communicate in between meetings. Um, and then we decide what to do with the issues that are in front of us, right? that we have enough information. We may decide to do nothing, right? Uh, if, if we think that someone is uh, filing a report in bad faith, uh, or if it's outside our jurisdiction as a group, we may decide to just go back to the reporter and say, hey, we're not gonna take any action on this and here's why, right? Um, we may offer suggestions for those involved to try and resolve the issue themselves right, rather than intervening directly. Um, sometimes we do need to do mediation. It can take the form of we're going to talk with one party, we're going to talk with the other. Uh, if we think it makes sense, we may then have them talk with each other, with one of us present. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we, uh, you know, the best answer is for them not to interact with each other. But sometimes we can actually make it work, and that's nice. Um, so, in the cases where there's 
a clear code of conduct violation. We'll talk with the person or persons who engage in the violation um, to help them understand the impact that their uh, words or actions had. And if necessary, um, we will recommend permanent or temporary bans from various community spaces. So again, because we're not part of the Drupal Association, we don't have uh, legal jurisdiction or control over uh, you know, user accounts on Drupal.org uh, or whether or not someone is allowed to come to uh, one of our events. But what we can do, uh, we have very good relationships with the Drupal Association, and we can go to them and talk with them and say, hey, this happened, and this is why we think this person should be banned from uh, an event or why that their, their user privileges uh, on the website should be revoked. And then they will take the appropriate action. Um, so, you know, in some cases um, where we have where we have issues where there's there's someone, for example, who who might be get upset in the issue queues a lot and be uh, show their frustration in, in unproductive or non-productive ways, right? Uh, sometimes what we can do is is intervene with that, and we, with whom we receive a, of a variety of multiple reports, right? Sometimes what we need to do is go to that person and, and help them understand uh, and take responsibility for the fact that, hey, you know, when you yell at people, it has an impact on them. And let's see if we can find some better ways to communicate feedback so that you can be a more effective contributor you don't have to spend your time dealing with all of these reports that people are making, and you can actually help others become more effective contributors as well. So again, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but we think it's worth the effort to try. Um, in some cases, we might receive an after-the-fact report about a situation that's already been resolved. Um, in those cases, we review the incident, decide whether further action is necessary, and keep it on file for reference, uh, just in case something similar comes up in the future involving you know, one or more of the same folks. Uh, while most of the issues that we tackle uh, come from issues that are reported to us, uh, our process is not exclusively complaint-driven. Uh, we're all active and engaged members of our community, and if we think that, if we see something that we think needs to address, we'll put it on the agenda and talk about it as a group. So, over the last few years, we've learned a few lessons. We learned a lot of lessons. Here's a few of them. <laughs> um, one is that when we're in the conflict resolution or mediation process, it's really important to uh, manage expectations uh, and make sure that all involved parties uh, agree to accept the outcome of the proposal. Uh, we can't always assume uh, good faith, and you know, if folks agree to go through this process of, of mediation, um, they can't just get to the end of the process and decide, well, you know, I don't like that advice, I'm going to ignore it. Uh, at that point, then we need to take additional action. Um, escalation and appeals uh, need to be well-defined and well-documented, uh, you know, particularly when you're dealing with a conflict. Uh, chances are that, that one or both parties are not going to like the outcome of, of that, and, uh, and if they do decide to appeal, it needs to be clearly understood what their options are. Using discretion when deciding what details to share publicly, this is a very challenging one uh, because, you know, I think one of the things that Denise said in her keynote this morning, right, was that like transparency was the lifeblood of open source. <laughs> and sometimes we can't be, in this work, sometimes we can't be transparent because doing so would harm others or would undermine trust making it less likely for people to tell us when things are happening. On the flip side, in some cases, not sharing certain details can also have the same effect. So we need to be really careful, and this is highly dependent on the type of situation, what's going on, but we need to be able to, so one of the things that we do 
in our, in our report. So we put out anonymized public minutes that say, hey, we dealt with this issue, um, this is roughly what it involved, and we try to word that in a way that unless you were one of the folks who witnessed or was directly involved, you're not gonna necessarily know who it was about. Um, here's what happened, here's the action we took. That's really hard to do, and uh, we don't always do it well. Uh, one of our, my other colleagues on the CWG was at an event last week and you know, was talking this through with, with some folks at a session there and got some really good feedback. So I think we know how to make our minutes clearer. Of course, we also have a non-public version of our minutes that we keep where you know, we're able to, to see and talk about exactly who was involved and what happened in more detail. Alluding to what I said earlier, um, this is intense emotional labor. <laughs> so we have to remember to practice self-care. We work, we have to work really hard uh, to mitigate or prevent burnout. Um, this is really hard work. Uh, and, you know, the reality is that, you know, maybe uh, this is something may, someone can maybe do for a year or two. Um, a little bit longer if you're a cold-hearted bastard like me, but uh, it, uh, it is really hard work and, and it, it does require being able to know when to say, look, I need to step back, I need to take a break for a little bit so I can come back with fresh perspective. Uh, and then, of course, one thing we've definitely learned, and I think this ties into uh, the point I made on the previous slide about, uh, about transparency, is that even if we can't talk about the specific incidents or the specific people involved, we always need to be communicating our purpose, our scope, and, and our processes, how we do things to the wider community. And so this is something that we started to do. We, when we're able to, we go to local events, uh, meetups, and camps. We talk there. Uh, we have a session at the, um, at the Drupal conferences, the one in the US and the one in Europe. So um, folks, are, folks are able to find out who the heck we are, what we do, and how we do it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the kind of hot button issues that we've been struggling with over the last, uh, particularly the last couple of years. Uh, one is online harassment, which has just really exploded as an issue for us in the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, so there are some people who feel that no matter what they say or do outside of a project space, only their behavior inside the project space should matter. Um, this is a hot button issue, but, but to me it's, it's pretty clear, right? If you're harassing and attacking people on social media, you can't then turn around and expect to collaborate productively with those same people on the project, right? So, um, so I think this is something that we need to clearly be thinking about as projects, is not just what's happening in our queues, what's happening, you know, with our issues, but like what's happening, the way that individuals uh, who are participating in those projects are interacting outside of it. So, let me be really clear, this is not a matter of free speech or political correctness, this is about treating those around us with basic human dignity and respect, right? Uh, so the shared values of our code of conduct apply regardless of what your personal, political, social, religious views are, but they're not an excuse to avoid accountability for your words and actions. So as someone who's responsible for upholding a code of conduct, it's not always easy to identify wh uh, who the trolls are and to hold them accountable, particularly if they're hiding behind anonymous handles or working in coordination with others, right? Um, so I think this quote, which is from a, a New, York, uh, New Yorker article about Reddit, uh, explains it really well, right? So trolls set this cunning trap. If you ignore them, you risk, seeking, you risk seeming complicit, but by responding, you amplify their message, right? And uh, I come from the old days of Usenet and, and all this stuff where the advice was ignore the trolls, right? 
And one of the questions that we're wrestling with right now is the extent to which we publicly speak out about specific acts of trolling in our community, knowing that doing so may draw more attention to the trolls and run the risk of validating their efforts. On the other hand, we're also hearing from people who say that they really want us to speak out about this stuff because they want us to make it really clear what sort of behavior is and is not acceptable in our community. So that's something we're, we're kind of wrestling with. Um, another issue that we're working with is how to deal with incidents of uh, context collapse, right? So this is when people start sharing a story on social media without all the relevant details or context and demanding that immediate action be taken uh, because it seems like something that's like really bad. Um, sometimes it can be the result of a simple misunderstanding. Sometimes it's the result of intentional distortions or misrepresentations. But either way, these, these sort of things end up being uh, leveraged by people who may be pushing one agenda or another. And the way to deal with it is to provide the context, right? And then, you know, be patient. Try to understand what actually happened as fully as possible before, you know, taking action based on something that people are outraged about online. That's a really hard thing, because sometimes, sometimes it's legitimate. Sometimes it is something that is as bad as it sounds, and you do need to take action. And sometimes it's something that's taken out of context or misunderstood. And being able to tell the difference is uh, becoming something that's increasingly important. OK, got a couple more minutes left. Um, other new challenges. Uh, we need to address the fact that there's larger issues with harassment and assault that have been lying below the surface of years and have gone unaddressed. What we know is that people don't feel, often don't feel safe discussing their concerns openly because of the fear of a backlash that will result. So we need to get people to feel safe talking about these issues. Otherwise, people will think that the code of conduct doesn't mean anything. If there, if, if, if there is somebody who is engaging in bad behavior and it's only being circulated through whisper networks and no reports are being made and there's no way for the folks who are responsible for enforcing the code of conduct to know about it, then they won't take action and people will think the code of conduct doesn't mean anything and won't take, uh, and it will be less likely to make reports in the future, right? So we need to improve our processes for handing uh, for handling accusations of uh, sexual harassment or assault in a manner that is respectful of the needs of the victims. Uh, we need to keep better records of incidents that have occurred in the past so that we can more quickly catch patterns of conduct uh, that occur. Um, you know, I think we also need to, especially in the United States, uh, alcohol is very often a component in many of the incidents that are reported to us. So we need to have an honest discussion uh, about the fact that while many of us spend time together socially, we're also a professionally driven community of purpose. Uh, you know, some of us are here because we're paid to be. It's our job. Uh, and I think we also need to develop better relationships across projects to mitigate the impact of people who uh, may engage in, in do terrible things in one project and get kicked out of that project and then just go and do the same thing in another project. Um, I would love to see some sort of united nations of open source that could address these kinds of cross-project issues. So, got a minute left. I'm going to leave you with some positive things uh, that we can all do in order for everyone to be successful in open source. So, streamline communication channels. Make it easier for newcomers to go to connect with other contributors so that there's fewer misunderstandings. Mix asynchronous and real-time channels, Skype, Hangout, Slack, et cetera, as appropriate, and understand and appreciate that English is not everyone's first language. Second, keep improving documentation. Create easy-to-find summaries of active initiatives in your project so contributors can get involved with issues that interest them and provide architectural overviews for future contributors. Three, um, and there was some talk about this in the last session, expanding membership, uh, mentorship programs so that they don't just focus on newcomers, providing more support and training to mentors, and pairing mentors with high potential contributors for long-term one-on-one mentorships. Uh, provide non-code mentoring opportunities, such as event organizing, 
promote ex, uh, mentorship success stories in your community. Make it clear that this is something that's incredibly valuable. Um, also, um, broadening, creating a network of leaders uh, within your community and within open source in general who have uh, different backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives and focus uh, on developing skills like creative problem solving, conflict resolution, effective advocacy, and visioning. The more that folk we're able to broaden understanding of the project's community, its assets, and its challenges, the better we'll be able to, uh, to build leadership within the community and so that when we do experience challenges, there will be people there who have the tools to be able to uh, mitigate them. So, let's get started, and thank you very much. George, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, I would like to know how the community reacted when you introduced this working group, because I assume it didn't just exist, but at some point it was pitched, and I don't, or I don't know how that worked, but yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so the question was about uh, you know, it, how the community reacted when the working group was proposed, right? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so um, that, was, that occurred in Drupal about six years ago, and um, I, um, I had been involved a year earlier in helping uh, to promote an event code of conduct for our events. We already had a community code of conduct, but we didn't have a code of conduct for our events. And that conversation back in 2012 <laughs> was really, really contentious because at that time, a lot of people did not understand or appreciate the value of having a code of conduct for events. It was very much a lot of folks in the community were much, we all know each other, we all trust each other, can't we just rely on that, um, which wasn't sufficient. Coming out of that conversation and some other conversations, um, it was really clear that we needed some additional uh, structures and governance in Drupal because we were a, and are a rapidly growing project. And we were very quickly getting beyond that, hey, we all know each other place. And uh, so Dries, the project lead, got a bunch of people together uh, over, um, they had basically a, a weekend where they kind of worked out uh, some of these ideas and basically proposed it as part of, there was community working group, there was technical working group, there were a lot of sort of governance items that kind of all came together at once. It was something that uh, a lot of people felt was really needed, and so we didn't get a lot of uh, pushback at that time. Now that was, now at this point, 2013, five years ago. We're at the point where we have actually outgrown that governance model, and we're trying to figure out what the next governance model looks like. Um, you know, and there may be changes. There very, very will likely be changes to the way that we handle conflicts and code of conduct issues as a result of that. And uh, it is a challenge because we are really getting s stuck on what the best way to achieve that is, right? That there's, we're very much a community that is all about sort of things bubble up from the community, which is awesome and wonderful and great. And, but there's also a desire to have some kind of top-down uh, you know, uh, governance as well. And so, and folks agree that that is necessary, but what that exact balance is, is a matter that is highly contentious. So I think I answered more than your question there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, George. Um, we are run out of time, but uh, you're around here. So the next talk will be like in six, seven minutes. Thank you, everyone.